Okay, there. Cool. Is this on? Oh, it's just for YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, whatever then. Yeah. Okay. Cool, everybody. Thanks for showing up uh, to the university um, um, JavaScript event. Uh, my name's Lloyd Starr. I just joined Cloud a month ago as their chief operating officer. Prior to that, I was uh, building large commerce solutions for the music industry, the dance music community. Are we uh, the dance music community a company named Beatport. Um, and after we sold that, uh, I wanted to get back to corporate and, and into uh, startups that cloud space provided for that. I actually still live in Denver, but I'm beach over the weekend. It was great. Sharks over there, actually. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, which kind of blew my mind a little bit. Uh, we don't have sharks in Denver. Um, but one, one of the reasons, shark, what? Shark. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, I'm really excited to be a part of Cloud Space uh, because the way that they approach uh, solving problems is actually not a, a full discipline like, hey, we're just going to use Ruby on Rails and uh, accomplish the problem. Actually treat every client like a startup. And, and we get down to it. We look at their business model. We help them with their sales pitch sometimes. And then we, um, and then we pick the right for implementation, uh, which is really exciting. And so what this group is very exciting is of the really talented and smart people who are working in disciplines, technologies. I know this is obviously based on script, but all to network with each other, find new projects. And our only ask of you is if you build something that's really cool, that you come uh, at our event and, and tell us what you've done and how you met. We love the story as well. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to the head of uh, the tech group here, Caitlin, to uh, kick us off and go through the agenda. <laughs> there you go. Woohoo! This is an amazing. This makes me really happy. I like this. So, a couple of things. Uh, I'll pair off with, with what Lloyd was saying with you guys coming out and speaking and everything. One of the things I really do love about having the University Tech Meetups, all of them, is just all the different connections that you can make. I've met so many different people over the last. We're about to come up to our one-year anniversary, and I've met so many different people and made so many different connections that it's unbelievable. And I've become really friends with a lot of you guys that sometimes I wonder why I'm still friends with you, but <laughs> <laughs> but you know, a good time. It makes me really happy when I have everybody come up to me and they're like, you know, this person really helped me out with this project. I had a huge, couldn't get past this. I spoke to this guy while we were getting a beer. And you know what? He really helped me out. Or you know, I really speak, but maybe I suck at public speaking, and I'm not able to do it. I'm horrible at it, but here I am speaking in front of many people right now. And you know, we allow that comfortable environment where maybe you are not the most expert in script, or maybe you're not the most expert person in Ruby, but you can still come up here and speak about something that you're passionate about. And that's what I really enjoy about all of this is because I get to see you guys get passionate. You guys talk about really cool things. I mean, the possibilities are endless getting up because then you also have this video that you can take. Use this on use this as a build. Hey, look, here's the link to the YouTube video. Go to this time slot on this video and watch me talk about this one thing that I'm really passionate about, something I actually built. I've had a lot of you guys come through here and speak, and I love the repeat speakers, but I would love to get more people up here that have not presented, have not actually said something. Let's continue to grow that. I mean, we're all for building the community. There's that little spiel there. Um, and not to that. Completely worth it. Once again, you meet other fellow developers like you, but you're leading people in the industries, all tech who feels a passion towards tech. Um, friends too, uh, we are still doing Orlando Tech Pub Crawl as well. That's Friday. 
Um, so come out to that. That's where you can wind and kind of be silly and have fun with it. Uh, let's see what else is happening. Anybody else have any events they kind of want to talk about real quick? I know you I have do. A question. What's that? Uh, there are five Tuesdays in July. No, in September. Huh? Yep. No, don't kill me, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ian, what's up? Back in April, I built a JavaScript app in three weeks and gave a talk about it. It was an all women <laughs> speaking JavaScript meetup. Yeah. Pretty ridiculous. Um, you guys will get to see it, and yes, the code is now. Finally, you guys are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> speaking of that whole friendship thing where I question whether or not I'm actually, like, why I'm still friends with he's one of them. <laughs> all right, but I would like to announce Rogers to come up here and speak. He is one of my probably greatest when it yes 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 you helped he helped start this with me and Ruby talk yeah back in <laughs> September <laughs> so further ado you're gonna get some awesome knowledge from this kid right here awesome Woo! okay so let's talk about JavaScript, right? That's, that's a thing we could do. So uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, uh, I am the first David in David in the JavaScript. I look like this on the internet. Um, I've actually got a slide deck that we can go to, which has my talk a little bit tonight about a tool that I teach in my uh, front end class at the Iron Yard uh, called Browser Sync. So, uh, Browsersync.io, for those of you who are following along at home, uh, you can check that out. This is me. This is what I look like on the internet. If you take pictures of me and post them on the internet, into this, that is not a thing, but I am working on it. Uh, you can find me all, everywhere on the internet as Al the X. If you would like to know why Al the X, you will have to get to know me a lot drunker. Um, I'm GitHub. I'm j.mp.al underscore the underscore x. If you want to stalk me on the internet, that is a thing that some people do. I don't recommend it. I'm very boring on the internet. I just basically look like this. Talk about browser sync. Anybody? Anybody here build things and tools? CSS and HTMLs, right? And we store them in a folder. And then we want to look at what they look like. Browser, right? That's the, that's the thing that we do most of the time. Uh, anybody ever run into this problem where uh, I have built something that is supposed to go live on the internet, but it's on my laptop right now, and I can run it from my laptop and open it in a browser, but I am still in development, so that means that I am typing furiously while also quickly switching to the browser and hitting Command R over and over and over again. This is a problem that almost every, at least, entry level developer runs into at some point in their life because Command R. In case you did not know, in case that zoomed right over your head, that is, the, that is the keyboard shortcut for reload the browser. So my general workflow when I get started with working on a web project is edit some files, edit some files, edit some files, switch to the browser, reload the browser. Oh my god, that totally did not work. That was bad. No, go back, go back, go back. Go back to the command, go back, go back, command tab, editor. Editor, editor, editor. We're going to edit some more stuff, then we're going to switch over to the browser, and we're going to hit We are developers at our heart, so that sounds a lot like a manual process, and developers automate manual processes. So what can I do to automate that manual process? Enter Browser BrowserSync is a small JavaScript library for, this is my one, one sentence summary, this is, what I get to, this is what I get to be proud of for today. A JavaScript library for rapidly testing and tweaking websites, and that's, that's key, and applications across multiple devices and networks. So let's unpack that a little bit. First of all, it's a JavaScript library, so this is written entirely in JavaScript. It's actually written uh, in Node.js JavaScript, so it's designed for Node.js. But it also works in the browser, so it's got some browser parts, which means that it's written in browser JavaScript as well. Browser JavaScript and Node JavaScript living together, cats and dogs, end of the world times. Uh, it is designed for rapidly testing and tweaking, and when I'm talking about testing, I'm not talking about running your, your uh, tests, running your automated tests 
which you could theoretically do with browser sync, but that's not really what it's for. Visual testing. And when I need to rapidly test and tweak something, some little UI, especially those niggly little details of CSS three pixels to the left, to the left, the other left, please, you're going to die, the other left. It's for websites and applications. A website being, you know, just static CSS and HTML or mostly static HTML, or maybe a content management system that generates mostly static CSS. A web application being something slightly more interactive involving JavaScript in the browser, making some AJAX requests, maybe it's using a framework like Angular or Ember uh, or Backbone, something like that, talking to an API on the back end, or maybe even something like, dare I say it, WordPress? WordPress being a web, full web application, a content management system application, but still something that I would interact with and that might make multiple requests to the back end. Uh, and perhaps most, interesting, most interestingly is that I can use this on multiple devices and, uh, and across multiple networks. Well, no duh, it's the internet, right? I can pull this up on my phone and I could look at it on my phone. Browser Sync just makes it really easy to do. And we'll look at that. I've got a little bit of a demo after we get the clicky clicky points. Explaining in, 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 uh, from a couple different angles here, Dev. Those are people, those of us with HTML and CSS and JavaScript on the front end, where most are might as well be the browser as far as we're concerned. Uh, some of the questions that browser syncs helped me answer is how could I how can I quickly see the adjustments that I'm making to my code? Now I can open the inspector and tweak a bunch of stuff and then out or copy them out if I'm less if I'm using a just a uh, an, an inspector property that I can very quickly grab the value and stick it in my CSS file. But then how do I know that that is the only thing that I've changed? Well, the only way to do that is to refresh the browser and see that that change, that I made the correct change. How can I quickly test my code visually across a number of different devices? Some, have anybody ever worked with where, someplace where there's a device lab? Well, I've actually got, like, I have targeted devices that I have to hit, and one of them is this, this sad little Sony Vio running Internet Explorer 8 on Windows XP sitting in the corner whose only job is to fire up the Internet every now and again and mangle it horribly. Yeah, uh, some places, like uh, where, I was, where I was at a couple years ago at Cone, we had multiple devices from Samsungs to Blackberries, Apples, anything you could possibly imagine phones, everything, and any app that was built had to be tested across every one of those devices. Now that's much more complicated for native device developers, for people that are building an Android, S uh, the Android SDK, JDK, and, the, uh, and for Objective-C. They have to actually install their, uh, their application on each one of those platforms. For those of us who are working in the web, we have the advantage we just fire up a web browser. But have you ever tried to just fire up a web browser in like a dozen different devices and then execute the same tests on a dozen different devices all across the room? Can be slightly tedious. I, th th there's, there's an additional question there. How do I test my new client side code? Say I'm working on the UI. I'm working on the uh, of an application that talks to an API that's written in some archaic language like PHP. And uh, for those of you who don't know, I also run the PHP group, so that was a slight dig on myself. You guys are not really responsive tonight. Am I going to have to drink some more? I guess I have to start asking questions. Uh, so how do I test my client side code, my UI in JavaScript and CSS and HTML, some stable version of the API that's deployed elsewhere, maybe on a, uh, another developer's machine or something like that? This is good for backend devs as well. This is how, how do I test the latest UI build against my crazy feature in the how do I know that what's deployed in production for the UI, the API that I've been tinkering with for the last two days. And then how do I share my environment, my local environment that has the API running on my local database with a front end dev who's on his own machine and uses that crazy support because he hadn't gotten with the Vim yet, or whatever the flame war in the internet is this, uh, this week, kiddos. How do I share that my environment with 
him or her so that she can help me debug the UI code that I, I apparently have broken with my API changes. And this kind of settles into like my dev manager's perspective. Uh, how can I get my front end devs and my back end devs playing nice together? If anybody's ever had to try to shove a nicely designed UI into the Rails line, uh, oh my gosh, that's just not even something that you want to do. Uh, so this tends to create silos between the front end devs and devs where we just build our API and you just build your pretty little widgets or whatever, and you call us when you've got some more widgets to, to hook up to the real API, how can they interact with one another? And then how can my testers, who are not developers at all, test UI dependent of API code? And then how can I provide like a tech demo to a stakeholder without having this three-day requisition where we have uh, IT set up a server and have the dev team deploy to the server. I've been in places like this. You guys do not know what it was like before the cloud. It was terrible. It, was terrible. it still is terrible in most places, actually. So I know what you actually want to see is a demo. So let's talk about a demo, right? Any questions so far on this? Is zooming straight past everybody? Is that what this is? Anybody ever used browser sync for real? Like all of Raising their hand. I don't know what you're this sounds horrible. <laughs> Anybody ever used uh, Connect or uh, the Live Reload, a Live Reload tool, right? Yeah, live, Sublime Live Reload, actually. Or uh, Brackets, Brackets.io, yeah, Brackets. Or uh, Adam Reload, Adam, Adam, yeah. You guys just try everything, don't you? This is <laughs> None of this is for me! <laughs> So let's look at some demos, and I think I'm going to have to go into mirror mode here. That's uh, right. Right? Anybody? Anybody? Bigger? 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 Thirty more pixels. Thirty more pixels. Right. Well, I'm glad you're paying attention, yes. I, I am Alvex at Macatron Prime. That is the name of my computer. And uh, what we're going to be looking at today is uh, a, a um, assignment that I usually give my students called uh, Responsive Multi-Column Form. It comes from the folks at Timpanus. They run a blog. You go to codrops.com. They've, uh, they've got a bunch of these little demos. Eh, internets? Yeah, internets? Yeah, internets. All right. We go to code drops, their blueprints. They've got a bunch of these, uh, these like little layouts, HTML and CSS layouts. And the one that my students love the most is responsive multi column form, which is available on GitHub. Yeah, all the source code is there. It's got a you know, straight up HTML. If I take a look at where we're at right now, I've, I've got a pub folder. Actually, let's do that real quick. If I look at where I'm at right now, I've got a um, API directory. That is a vestigial API directory. There's nothing in it. Um, simple package.json and a server.js, which we'll get to later. If we uh, check out the content, um, check out the contents of the pub folder, uh, you can see I've just got some CSS files hanging out in there. All of this stuff came from the, this responsive multi-column form uh, repo, an index.html, some JavaScript files, nothing fancy. Uh, if I wanted to serve this directory, if I wanted to look at that index.html, I could, if I was really unsophisticated, I'm just a man, I don't understand your complex scripts. I could just open index.html and I would get something that looks like this. I right, have a responsive form, it's got some fields built into it. Not particularly fancy. If I filled out my name and hit enter, it doesn't really do much for me. But it does put, the, uh, put all the uh, components of that form into the get request. Super awesome.
That's really great. But if I was to try to do anything, like if this was a complicated UI and I was actually trying to do AJAX requests, make requests to an API, this would totally barf because AJAX requests are not allowed from file colon slash slash. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? There's no internet here. This is a totally fake internet. So instead of just opening the uh, HTML file, I'm going to use browser sync. Now, I have previous to this presentation globally installed browser sync with this command, npm install dash browser sync. Now that depends on me having npm installed, which comes from Node. I can install Node with brew Node or many other, uh, many other options available to me, including there's a Windows installer if you're still on Windows. God bless your soul. Okay. <laughs> one day, one day. I've got browser sync installed, which means I have a command called browser sync. Now wait a second, Dave, you told me that this was a JavaScript library. Well, it is a JavaScript library, but it also gives me a convenient command that I can use anywhere. Browser sync by itself. Browser sync start is the simplest way I can invoke this. And it gives me a blurb of JavaScript that I could drop into my index.html file or any other, any, any other uh, HTML uh, that I would want. And uh, also runs a server on localhost 3001. Oh, you know, I probably have browser sync running on another port already, so I should fix that before I get too much further. Now that's not particularly useful to me because I don't really want to copy and paste this sucker into my index.html and then have to remove it in version control or whatever. And the folks at Browser Sync, let me make sure, yeah, foreground, that sucker, sorry. The folks at Browser Sync realize that I probably don't want to do that. Also give me a dash dash server option. And the dash dash server option, I can pass just a directory that I would like to be the document root for my static server. Under the hood, this is using uh, express and express dot, I think it's actually using connect dot static. It's not using express dot static, it's using connect dot static. It's a module for NPM. It's got all that stuff installed. We can go look inside of the uh, node modules uh, directory for browser sync and see all those dependencies. If I start this with the pub directory, it automatically opens that in my browser. You can see now I'm at localhost 3000, just like I would if I had run the Rails server or something like that. Standard, I don't have to sudo the sucker. Uh, localhost 3000 pulls up my multi-column form, but it's a full HTTP server. So that means any of my AJAX requests that I would want to execute from here, anything if I had jQuery on the page and I was uh, loading in some files or loading in some, some data from JSON files, that worked just fine. Well, if that wasn't cool enough, half of the, that, so that gives me the browser part of browser sync, right? But there's still a second part. There's the sync sync. Browser sync into serving up a public directory for me that little snippet of JavaScript in the server that's running in the background also synchronizes any sort of events between these two. So here I've got two browser windows serving up the exact same form. And if this is not confusing enough, then I will split one into a uh, smaller view, split a larger one into this, right? So I've got, I've got two separate forms. These are definitely two separate browser windows looking at the same form. Everybody okay with that? Nothing up my sleeve. I'm not actually not wearing very much sleeves, right? Now watch what happens when I start filling out the form here. As I filled out the form on the right-hand browser, the form fields in the left-hand browser just showed up. Typing that I was doing, that I do in one, there's. Well, you can imagine if I wanted to see what this looked like in a responsive situation, this could be really handy. And what's more, even scroll events and changes this doesn't pull up the uh, doesn't pull up the select box because that would be silly and very confusing. But it even attempts to do a pretty good job of syncing up the scrolling between two disparate sizes where uh, these fields don't really match. 
So that's kind of the second part there. Not only does it serve the contents of a, a web directory for me, and I can navigate around normally, uh, but it also synchronizes any events that happen between the two of them. Click events, change events, form fill events, so on and so forth. Well, that's neat and all, but you promised me giant device compatibility. Yes, there is all kinds of stuff. You, you should also recognize that there is a uh, external IP address printed out on the console when I opened Browser Sync, and a UI external. What, what's going on there? Uh, who's on the, the local Wi-Fi? Who's on the uh, Cloud's UTech Meetup Wi-Fi right now? Everybody, anybody who's on the Wi-Fi right now? Anybody? I need some volunteers. Serge, Chip, David K. All right, you guys crowd around. I can run browser sync with another. Oh, I'm going you one more thing. While you guys, uh, while they wow you with their magic. If I just pass a simple dash dash directory flag, uh, in addition to, to server, it'll give me a directory of the document root. So I can poke around, see what files exist, go to my index.html. If I had other HTML in here, I could check them out as well. And any one of the, any one of the windows that I had open for localhost 3000 is now synced up again. So I'd have to surf to, a very spe to the specific index.html to see it. Oh, look at this. <laughs> Sergio being awesome again, right? What just happened there? Serge, what did you do? I hacked your computer. You did <laughs> not hack my computer. With, with, my, with my, uh, my, my uh, very permissive permission, as a device that is on the local network right now, can go to 10.100.3.179.3000. And that will bring up this form. Oh my gosh. It's blowing my mind right now, right? And you can scroll. I'm not touching anything. There's ghosts in the machine. Oh my God, I'm going to die. And I, can, I can make it small, and I can make it smaller, and bubbles. <laughs> what are you doing, bubbles? I'm coloring. You can never say Right? Nothing happens anymore. Browser Sync gave me the magic there. Browser Sync is taken from every device that's connected and sending those events to every other browser, every other browser that is connected. That's pretty awesome. What other things can it do? Well, this is just the command line. I have a question. Yeah? Um, most server events are from creating bugs that wouldn't normally exist. Well, bugs already exist. So, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. What's ever been it from displaying incorrectly on one device just because of how the internet model? Well, I mean, it's not going to kill everything, but it is just doing simple DOM JavaScript. Uh, if you, every time, every key press that you press on that form, <laughs> it's at the document. And that's not to say that uh, if you have event listeners on those form elements that you've added in JavaScript, they're not going to clobber what Browser Sync is doing. Um, no guarantees here that this is going to be 100% perfect technology. What, you want the alien tech now? You want it to also read your mind and fill out the form? No. Well, what's the benefit of using it then? Uh, so imagine if I just want to see that form validation works on all 12 devices, right? What if I have my responsive version of the form and uh, my version of the form, and then also if I had enough monitors, if I had enough monitors, I would all put my full-sized version of the form, which it just killed browser sync. So this is kind of a lame example. All right, I've got my full-sized desktop version of the form. I've got my mobile version of the form. I've got my uh, tablet version of the form. I've got everything working together. I can at least get some visuals on what the form is doing, right? Well, it, I mean, you can do that just by dragging the browser on, wouldn't you? 
Yes, I could, but is that more efficient? How, how efficient is it for me to uh, drag the size of my browser around Pretty efficient, compared to... Anytime I, I, my job as a developer is basically a glorified typist, okay? I, I type very specific words that aren't really English. <laughs> Where do I do most of my typing? I, I would say typing, unless I'm on the mouse. I do all on the keyboard. Anything that I have to do to remove my fingers from the keyboard decreases my efficiency and creates a, what's called a context switch. When I have to switch the context of my brain from typing keys on a keyboard to, oh, this is getting very interesting. Uh, <laughs> yeah. switch, my, my, switch my context from typing keys on a keyboard to mousing with uh, even one hand or reaching down to a trackpad, I'm forcing myself, I'm forcing my brain to move the context of typing and into mousing. Those two things are completely different. I'm, I'm changing modes. Uh, if I could instead have a monitor, a 24 inch monitor that has plenty of room on it, and I have three or four windows set up tiled like this so that I can see my mobile display, I can see my tablet display, right? I can see, I can even see my desktop display maybe at half height or something. And I can very quickly see that I'm making in CSS directly affect all three of those display property, all, display, this, all three of those display profiles. Well, I can see that. I just don't see the syncing between them, which you type in a form. I don't see that providing well, any... Well, what, what if you have, like, a mobile device, right? You're dealing with least compatibility with an iPad, with uh, an Android tablet, and then multiple form factors that you're dealing with are really useful because you're not having to go through and do the same thing 15 times to certify that this device will work. Sure. I mean, I can see the benefit of the and showing you the different sizes on the CSS, but I don't see the benefit of one form having the same information as the other form you type in. But it's all going to be validated on one device. I mean, if I type it in this device and I type an incorrect character, it's not going to sync it to the other character, is it? Of course it is. Uh, you're validating per device. Right. So when you click submit, each device is submitting its own form. So right. You see Right, but I mean, like, if you're saying, if you're having the validation on the form, and this form here invalidates that, that you know, the character that you didn't want to have it, and doesn't even add it to the fill, is this still going to propagate on one that's not working? Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. We should experiment with that afterwards. Yes. Yes. So if I was to back up a level... If, the, if, if I had more things to look at here, it would be a little more interesting. To navigate on this page, it will follow the click events to navigate those pages. I, I also have, uh, if we go back to the terminal for just a second, I've also got a UI that runs on the next port over. So localhost 3001. Brings up a small UI with a link to my running site, the external IP that, I, uh, that I'm using, where I'm serving files from, and oh, look at all these jokers screwing around with my, I can see all you, Andrew, oh, look, there's a mobile, an iPhone in the house, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> right? I also have, it also exposes all of the options that are available in the server from the UI. So I could turn clicks off, so I'm not going to mirror the clicks. I could turn scroll on and off, submitting forms and inputs, so on and so forth. I can see of all of the things that have happened across the connected devices. There are, there are plugins available, although there are few. Uh, perhaps some of the most interesting things is remote debugging. So anybody ever done any remote debugging for HTML5 devices? Oh my Jesus, right? <laughs> Apple has made this simple enough. But Android still goes through this uh, install ADB. And so to what? Just to, I just want to like debug the freaking web page. Could we, yeah, do it from Chrome and like connect Chrome to the devices and okay, whatever. Uh, there has been a project for a while uh, coming out of PhoneGap. Uh, let's see if I can up here. Coming out of PhoneGap called Winery. Uh, you can actually pronounce this any way you want to. Uh, the developer behind this. <laughs> 
the developer behind this, uh, this little utility is obviously a developer, and that continues to have features and not pretty websites. But basically, Winery opens a Chrome inspector or WebKit inspector for a mobile device. And Browser Sync will sync those up for you. If I, it, Winery's running, uh, as soon as I remote debugger, access remote debugger, opens a new tab, right? I can see all the different targets that I've got, so there's lots of different devices out there. Let's see if we can screw with someone. Isn't that a shame? <laughs> yeah, so I could totally screw with someone by, uh, let's see here, I'll just go into, uh, take a second because uh, it's actually loading this content dynamically. It's actually talking to whoever's browser this is that I'm just screwing with. Or not, right? I could also do stuff like alert. Hello, jerk face. <laughs> right? Someone probably got, some, well, it's mobile, so who knows if alert works on your particular browser or not, <laughs> right? I could turn off the remote debugging. <laughs> I, can, I can overlay, this is a, a neat feature, I can overlay a CSS grid on top of my, uh, uh, on top of this thing, that's the wrong sucker. Oh no, now I've got this lovely CSS grid all over my stuff and I, I broke a bunch of things, but that's fine. Right? And I can customize, uh, I don't want a 16 pixel grid, I want a, I don't know, 8.5% uh, grid? Why not? Let's try that out. And hey, look, there's percent. So I, now I've got a percentage based grid that's going to resize with my browser. It's going to be really easy, for, really handy for, um, for laying things out. Right? Tons of options available to me, including some ones, some, of, some that are a little hidden inside of here. 1010, 100.3.179, that's really easy to remember. So uh, if I check out browsersync.help, brash dash help, I've got a couple options. Easier, I've got uh, dash dash XIP, that's uh, this, this line right here. Dash dash XIP. Anybody ever? XIP is our friend. XIP is a magic wildcard DNIC, any local, local IP address in front of .xip.io. Then it will make a request to XIP.io and give me back that, I, that local IP address. So I, don't, I can present a somewhat public facing IP address from inside of my local network. That could be interesting. What does that do on the command line? Well, it's actually a little more interesting when we use the dash dash tunnel option. So if you've heard of XIP, have you heard of local tunnel? Local tunnel .me does something very similar. If I start up local tunnel, it will give me a unique URL from uh, uh, blah, 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 dot local tunnel dot me. And that's a publicly available IP address. It actually creates a local tunnel. So I could do a tech demo with someone who's not on my local network. Would you like to see it now? Of course you would. All right. No open dash dash tunnel. My ridiculous tunnel, I the books dot local tunnel dot me. I believe I can also pass a uh, parameter call the X. Maybe not. Yeah, they're jerks. Dashes are totally valid. So now aldx.localtunnel.me is tunneling my IP address. So even if you're not attached to, uh, even if you're not attached, you can still see my form and what do Waffle House, right? Great for a quick tech demo with somebody. Uh, hey, I'm on the phone with this client and I totally need to show them the new feature. Thanks, sales guy. Sure, let me just fire that up. 
Last feature, right? Uh, most of you don't deal with just plain front end APIs all the time, right? There's a back end API too. So far, isolating the front end API. It, I'm just serving the contents of the pub directory. It's talking to some, I don't know, it's talking to nothing right now. Most of us deal with some back end API that's serving up everything, whether that's WordPress or a Python Flask script or uh, I don't know, Node.js in the background. Node.js, JavaScript on the back. I'm destroying your world, sir. I'm sorry. Node.js, no JavaScript on the back end. If I uh, check out some, a quick little server J, just a small express, I'll get this right eventually, I swear. Uh, a small little express.js straight from the express.js docs. This is not fancy. Uh, I do, I, it's just an echo server, so it's got an API route. It's down here. It's got an API route that if you, if you issue a get request to it, it will send you what you sent it. It will send you any query parameters that you sent it. If you post to it, do any query parameters that you sent in the body or any, any uh, form parameters that you sent in the body. This gobbledygook is just so that you can send it JSON or form parameters. Nothing too doesn't do anything. This is not like, this is a, imagine, imagine one day what a powerful API this will be from its humble beginnings. It's just a simple echo. This is crap. Why would you even show this? Because I can do this. Because I can do this. I can run that server, node server.js, right? And so it's listening on port 8000. Background that sucker. And now I'll tell browser sync to start in proxy mode and proxy localhost 8000. So what's it going to do? Well, it's going to open up localhost 3000. It's proxying any requests to itself over to the API. So if I was to make an API request right now, if I was to, if I was to have an Ajax request, if I had a backend service running, if this form was submitting to API host the response I would get back is an echo, uh, right? It's not very complicated. But take it in a step further if I had WordPress running, for example, on a vhost, on my local host, or in MAMP, or in something like that. If I wanted to see what that looked like and have live reload, have the sync, I could just wrap it in browser sync. Oh, sorry, I, I skipped one part of my demo. In addition to, I can also watch files. That seems like important, right? Uh, if I give it a pattern that it recognizes, it can be very uh, permissive. And we'll serve pub, right? I'll background that sucker. Let's change something that's nice and obvious, like responsive multi-column form, right? Responsive multi-column forms. Tag responsive single column form. Ah, ha, 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 ha. Right, and I write the file, and it reloads the page. Simple, basic operation. Uh, if I also we're to edit a CSS file, however. Position relative, why not? Position static, and we'll screw up the world. All right? Note that it gives me a little, uh, that might be really hard to see, so I'll change it back. It gives me a little indicator in the upper right. I a full browser reload. I got a little message that said injected component.css. It didn't actually reload the entire HTML page. It just replaced that CSS file, reloaded the CSS file on the fly. Does the same thing with JavaScript. It'll reevaluate the JavaScript, reinject the JavaScript. If it's everything's funky, you just reload the page and everything goes back to normal. So this is a tool that you can use regardless of what type of JavaScript you route, write, front end or internet. Uh, you can use this if you're just starting out with HTML and CSS. It's a great way to get your HTML and CSS right there in the page with a little bit of arcane foolery with the uh, command line flags. Uh, you 
could have it watch your files and automatically upload, uh, up, automatically update for you. And I'll push this all to GitHub so that you can get my uh, package.json and see how all this stuff is, uh, is set up if you're interested. About browser services, uh, you can ask any one of my students who use it every day. Or you can come to me and I will direct you at one of my students who use it every day. Uh, and this should be a lesson to all of my students. This is something that we covered in two. And I, I showed you a couple extra features that I plucked out of the documentation this week. This is totally something that you could present on any JavaScript or HTML or CSS meetup ever. Yeah? Where do you teach at? I teach at the Iron Yard. Thank you for that wonderful question. So I can plug my employer. I teach at the Iron Yard. It is a intensive boot camp for developers where we crank out entry-level folks and then have a six-month placement program to get them entry-level jobs in the industry thereafter. Any more questions? Yes, Sergio. Um, so in the beginning you were talking about be useful for back-end developers as well. Is there a way to, like say if you're working on an API and you also don't want to keep reloading the browser on the side, can your back-end server talk to browser sync and make Absolutely. Uh, well, so you, you two things. That files parameter that I just showed, or that the files. Right? If I run dash dash files, I don't. I'm limited to just files that I'm editing for the front end. I could make this anything. This could be API slash star dot php or star star slash star dot php in case I've got a ridiculously large application and also anything in the pub directory that's in the CSS directory, any of that stuff or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I also hinted that this is a JavaScript library. So all these command line flags are options that I can pass to the, to the library itself. Uh, over to that, it's got tons and tons and tons of options. And if I start putting those into a little JavaScript file and start using them maybe in my gulp workflow or my grunt workflow, uh, or even just have like a server.js hanging out inside the, um, uh, inside the, the bottom of the repository, I can uh, require sync and do all these things, including really complex uh, File watches and uh, one of the neatest one of the neatest things I can do with it is under the server section. Uh, I can give it that base dir which we did before, where it gives it. I just say pub serve what's in pub, or I could give it also show me the directory, or I could give it a couple base dir. What? Why? What? What? Huh? What? What? Huh? Yes, I could give it a couple different base dirs, and if it finds a file in the app directory, it will serve that. And if it, but if it doesn't, it'll look in the dist directory next. So if I've got my SAS files, for example, in app, and they get compiled into my dist directory, into CSS files, I link to my CSS files, browser sync don't find no CSS files in app, dist instead. Uh, I could also give it some routes. So I can have my Bower components installed wherever I want, and it will respond to components or slash API for canned data or all kinds of different things. This is also just a thin wrapper around um, on the connect middleware. So I can use connect middlewares anywhere that I would normally use connect middlewares. I could just like, this is a trivial example, but I could inspect an a, a request, a local request, and if it matches a particular pattern, maybe do some transformation different file instead, or just log something. Oh, oh, you sent me some data, let's just log it to a file. Kind of like we did with my, uh, my dumb API. And there's tons more options inside of there. Different things I can do with the proxy, put middleware in front of the proxy, so on and so forth. Other questions? From the back. Question back um, Speak loudly. Uh, so mostly it's just listening to events and passing them on to other browsers and then triggering those same events on those same elements. So as long as uh, 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 Ember or Angular or React, they all are really listening to DOM events. Uh, if, as long as the browser is triggering those same events, whether it's an event on or it's a change event on an input element or anything else like that, it's going to work just fine.
You guys got more questions? Again, come ask me, come ask my students. I'm gonna give it back to Caitlin. He'll, uh, give a round of applause for David Kay coming up next, right? Yeah. Mike. Mike. Oh, you want to talk to people? I got to talk to people. All right, I got to get this thing out. All right. So a quick little uh, plug in here. David over here also helps out with one of my startups called Fat Merchant. And we actually have a little bit of Fat Merchant swag, too. Some cozies and stuff. So Granted, sorry, my glasses because I stole them from. They're my favorite. They're my favorite little local startups. So they've been doing pretty awesome. They're a credit card processing company, but they're some crazy things. I love them. So, further ado, my buddy David over here, David number two, Crazy David, who started the Goat. Crazy thing with David. <laughs> I'm calling you Crazy David. Is talk, and we'll get around to beer after as well. So please stick around. By the way, Caitlin, look. It says cloud space, right? When I present, do it, it says butt space. That's because of the plugin, I promise. <laughs> okay. It's me. All right, so today I will be talking about reactive JS. The uh, parentheses between E is sort of a uh, sort of a distraction in order to attract the people who are like, cool, let's talk about React. It's not really going to be about React. I lied to you all. I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, so welcome to University JS at Butt Space. <laughs> I'm on Twitter, David K. Piano. Follow me if you want. All right, so the three main questions that you guys might have when you hear reactive is, first of all, what does reactive mean? I heard React was good. Again, all of you React JS people here. Sorry to disappoint you. And are you going to show those stupid goats again? So, our React if JavaScript experience is going to be sort of like this. It's, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to sugarcoat or anything. It's a bit of a learning curve, but reactive functional programming or functional reactive programming is a paradigm that will probably change the way that you look at things when script. If you guys use callbacks, if you use promises, event listeners, all of that stuff, all of those are observables. And we're going to talk about what that is in a minute. So again, React.js is not reactive.js. In fact, React.js doesn't really use much of the reactive principles. So it's sort of a misnomer there. But you could use React.js with React.js, but we're not going to go into that because it's almost beer o'clock. So <laughs> let's talk arrays. My friend Ray Ortega <laughs> back there. <laughs> it, yeah, he's hiding over there. So, in is a collection of things. Hopefully, you guys know that. You know, you do the little bracket, can't spell no today, notation like that. And you have arrays in JavaScript. It's a collection. They can be iterated. You could say, I want the first item, the second item, the zeroth item, the last item. They can be manipulated. You could go through each item of an array and do something. Hopefully, you're all familiar with for loops, while loops, stuff like that. And this is an important Arrays have a first and last element, meaning we could tell exactly when we get the array, how many things we have, and when it's going to be done. So let's talk about array manipulation real quick. Simple array, one, two, three, four. First is array mapping. Um, how many of you have heard of array <coughs> map filters? OK, most of you. So this is going to be extremely simple to you. So uh, this is ES6 notation. All we're taking is the number, and we're multiplying it by 2, and it gives us our expected results, 2, 4, 6, 8. Filter sort of works the same way for either to say, I only want the even numbers. So we're going to filter and get only the even numbers. And there's array This is not a function in JavaScript, but you could easily make it yourself. All we're doing is taking each of these arrays and flattening it into a nice, you know, one-dimensional structure, or whatever it is. 
Anyway, one, two, three, four. So we're denesting each of the arrays and making it flat. You could also chain all of these things. So we could take our previous array, concat it, so we get one, two, three, four. And notice that this array, so we could do dot filter on it again and get only the even values from it. And then we could map it and say double each number. And so now we get a new array. I want you to burn this image in your mind so that when we talk about reactive programming, things will sort of make sense. So each one of these returns a different array based on this one. Okay? Cool. So in observable, is one of the tenets of reactive functional programming. I keep mixing it up. It's actually functional reactive programming. But an observable is a collection over time. So instead of saying 1, 2, 3, 4, we're saying I'm doing 1, maybe in 2 seconds I'll do 2, then later I'll do 3, and then immediately after I'll do and then I'll say, hey, I'm done giving you numbers. We're done. So just think, arrays over time, all right? So you could also call them event streams, streams, or whatever you want. So anything can be an observable, including arrays, prom because as you can see, they're actually smaller. And a lot of the time when you look at programming, the whole timeline thing that I was talking about is usually uh, denoted in ASCII like this where our dashes denote like periods of time. So obviously there's a longer period of time between one and two, you know, instead of between two and three. And then that little pipe at the end says, we're done. I gave you everything. So um, yeah, let's call them streams because it's a lot easier to think about and observables is a really Microsoft. And I don't like Microsoft too much, so let's just call it streams. By the way, that's not a stream. That's just a tribute to Terry. <laughs> <laughs> so streams are asynchronous. Um, not like browser sync, not like this sync, but async. And we can live or subscribe to a stream with three functions. The first, because streams can emit one of three things. They could emit either values. They could emit a signal to say, hey, I'm done. I sent you all the data you wanted or they could send you an error. So, you know, if you've worked with promises, you could pass in on success, on failure, and always. This is sort of the same thing. And a much more visual way of presenting um, observables is by marble diagrams, or as I call them, observables, because it's sort of observables. So if, if you see, each of these marbles can represent a click event. And obviously, the person tried to double click here. So click, another click, through an error or something. So this could be represented as a collection over time, which is an observable. Line represents time. And remember the image that I told you? Well. This is sort of exactly what that is. Think of the top as if it were an array, except it's an array over time. We filter through it and grab only the even values. And then we map each of those values. So two and four, four and eight, because we're doubling each one. It's important to realize that every time we do something to a stream, it returns a new stream of data. So the, um, the easiest visualize this that I found is these really cool marbles. So this is an example of one. We have a stream that just shows three events. And each of those events are delayed by a second or so. And if you go on the site, you could actually drag these. Pretty cool. And you can see that each one is delayed. Uh, let's see, what's another one? Map, just like we talked about. Each one of these is mapped by multiplying it by 10. So at one point, it's, uh, it's a moment of time. In another, you. Two things to um, streams, such as merging them. 
this is where it gets a bit more complex. But if you could imagine the top two streams just coming together and forming a single stream, that's an example of an operation with two streams. And you could also concat them. This is an interesting one. The first stream is going to be concatted to the second stream. So the elements in the second stream don't get concatted until everything in the first stream is added on first. So even if this were here, or let's make it a little bit more delayed, you see it's not going to be added until we're done. You can play around with these if you want. But let's move on. Live coding time. So I was going to pretend to live code, but instead I'm just going to show you the code that I was going to do. It's a reactive code search, no surprise there. If you guys remember, almost a year ago, I did an Angular demo on a Goat database. And now I'm using the same Goat database, and I'm building sort of a poor man's type ahead. I'm not going to be using React or anything. So let's take a look at the code first. First thing we do is we're getting our observable from Rx, which, as you remember, and then we're getting our search info. Can all of you see that just fine? No? Didn't think all right. Good. More? I can't go much bigger than that. All right. So the next thing I'm going to actually zoom out a bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We have search key presses. I told you that anything can be an observable. So we're going to take that search input and we're going to key press event for the um, yeah to the key press event from the search input and this is going to be you guessed it a so just erase observable and or else you're going to get a little bit more confused this is a stream each one of these are operations on that stream each one of these gives a new stream so the first one we're doing is we're throttling it by one second, which sort of does the same thing as delay, right? So if you could imagine, um, that's, oops. <laughs> and that way, when you're typing, it's sort of like debounce, if you guys are familiar with debounce, where if you start typing, you don't want to search yet if you're still typing. You want it to wait at least a second before it starts searching. And I could make that 500 or whatever, I probably should. So let's make that 500. See, now I'm pretending that I'm actually live coding this. We could also filter each one of those clicks, so, or key presses, rather. So every time you press a key, it's emitting one of those on the marble diagram. And so we're only going to take a key press if the search input is greater than 1. That way, if we press backspace and we get rid of all the characters, it's going to be like, I'm not going to search for nothing. I actually want some goats. So each of those key presses, we're going to map to this new observable. See, that's dreams or observables. You could compose them. You could manipulate them. And they could uh, and do stuff to each other. I like that. <laughs> We have this magical function that goes to a goat API, whoever would build a goat API, and for this search input value, whatever I put in that text box. And then what's going to happen is it's going to give me a names. All right, so every time I press a key or I string, it's going to start searching for me. And because of that, we're going to have a lot of streams. I'm doing another operation, it's just switch latest, which all this does is says the latest stream. I want something that I started to go. I want whatever's in the text box right now. Now, the most um, part of this is this thing. So, here with events, we're going to the stream, which means every time something happens to this stream, every time it emits something, we're going to log it in our console. I didn't have enough time because I procrastinated, so 
you know, you're not going to see them here. See them in the console pretty soon. So let's open up the search for. That's not. All right. If I search for an alpine goat, notice how it doesn't start searching until I gave it, you know, a little bit of delay. Shows all of the goats. Actually, if I want all the goats, I would just type goat. That's not all the goats, but that's OK. We could search for goats for this purpose. So if I wanted milk, then goats for meat, although I do not. So goat. So we created a type ahead in, what, less than 20 lines of code. Imagine if you didn't promises or callbacks, anything else, it would take a lot more than 20 lines of code, right? So 20 lines of code have a full working type ahead that you have to go into the console. It might take a few more lines of code to, I guess, about React. Why do reactive programming? Reactive programming describes what things are and not how they work. Look back at the code, you could see each of these streams are what it is. The addresses that are filtered, you know, over 500 that then somehow return a list of goats. And because we're this concise, we have a higher level of abstraction. Layman's terms, that means we have less code, and less code is better. We don't want to end up with, we have to reverse, you know, hope that we somehow figure out what it does. This is pretty clear. I mean, 18 lines of code is not that hard to understand. It's also less stateful and I don't know. I have the search input, key presses, and I have the search, which is another stream from the search key presses. Three variables where each of these would have taken at least three variables on their own each. So less variables are better. Reactive programming can also be carried on to other languages. Why? Because it started at Microsoft, which is why they came up with observables, which is very Microsoft-y. In Java, Swift, C Sharp, lots of other languages. Quite frankly, it sounds cool. There's a ton of if you just click that link. I'm gonna Any questions? So what I did over here, did observable from are a lot of functions where you could actually tell it, hey, I'm converting an array, a map, a promise, or even a single object value like a number. I'm converting that to, uh, to a So act, or sorry, not Rx, in the background, is um, going and saying that this is a stream, except it's a values come at once, and I'm going to tell you it's over when the last value is there, because I know how many values are in there. So basically, it's converting it to a stream, and it's telling it when it's. So is that function basically returning a promise right now? It's ret returning. Yeah. It doesn't have to. Oh no no search goes, which isn't really a sync. Returning this array of goats. I just pretended it's async. It could be async, <laughs> but it's not async. But if he was to return a promise, he would know what to do automatically. Cool. Thank you. Rx does not require ES or Rx core. Choose. I mean, yeah, yeah, you can. In fact, it has wrappers for Angular too. I'm using Rx Lite. I'm only using, you know, pretty common functions. So. Anyone else? All right. Cool.